overloaders out there, I'm Jonathan, and this is going to be another Reality Overload. Uh, I have a very special guest with me. Uh, he's actually one of my neighbors, um, and he is enthralled in, in love with space and, uh, and everything that comes with the science. He even uh, worked on the uh, Voyager project for a little bit, and uh, he's making his own music now for and has his own YouTube channel. Three decades on the three Voyager. Three decades. So he, 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 uh, he has a, a vast amount of knowledge and I'm very glad to have him as my very first uh, uh, guest uh, on my show. So everyone, please welcome uh, Thomas Weeks. Go ahead, Thomas, Hello introduce there. yourself. Um, <laughs> how, yeah, how I, yeah, I'm the um, attitude control hardware and pointing specialist on the Voyager project, uh, a musician and other stuff. Okay, so so uh, your exact job. What exactly do you do with the Voyager um, project? Uh, that whole well, title of yours is quite unique. Okay, I, I'm the guy responsible for keeping the Voyager pointed at Earth, twenty four seven. Okay. Voyager sending data twenty four seven, every day until twenty thirty. Although the project will not last that long, we don't have enough power to run all the science instruments until that time period. Um, and also, I'm the star tracker, uh, uh, sun sensor, gyro, thruster, trend, anomaly investigator, blah, blah, blah. There used to be hundreds of people on the Voyager project. Now there's only about 10. So oh, wow. uh, everybody does about five jobs. Nice. And I'm the last engineer left on the project. Really? You are? Yeah. Uh, everybody else deals with uplink or downlink, meaning communicating with the spacecraft. Mm -hmm. uh um or uh you know also real-time analysis and uh, software Ooh. but i'm not those people okay <laughs> no no you make sure that the uh voyager is communicating though it's, it's pointing in the correct uh, direction so yeah get, i mean the, 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 the trick is we have two voyagers one's above the ecliptic plane and the, the other is below it and uh as the earth rotates around the sun uh, we need to keep pointing the antenna at the earth as it goes around the sun. Yes. And, uh, it, you know, it's, a it's a yearly, uh, uh, changing, uh, event, so to speak. Oh yeah. You know, I mean, I, the earth I, I, gets I, I, further I, I, and further away. And the sun right now is about just a little bit brighter than a full moon. Really? Know? So we're still tracking the sun, you know, and it's, it's just a little pinpoint of light this point wow wow yeah, yeah no i i remember uh carl sagan actually wanted uh one of the voyager uh cameras to be turned back to show yeah. Yeah. the planet 1990 and, and the, the earth yeah uh the pale uh, blue dot as they yeah. called it the earth was the size of of a pixel and that was in 1990 mm -hmm. um that was after completing the prime mission that we did in the 80s which was uh well the 70s in the 80s which was uh flying by Jupiter, then Saturn, then Uranus and Neptune, the only yeah. spacecraft to do that. And, and uh, as a consequence, we got a full view of the solar system uh, from a planet perspective. And uh, now both spacecraft have left the heliosphere uh, of the sun and are outside in inter interstellar space, you know, yeah, the I, first man-made objects to do that and measure scientific data. So we're seeing what's out there you know, beyond the, our solar yes. system. So, so actually to talk about that data, because I, I actually just uh, saw about this, um, how now that it has transferred over, it actually saw the difference between our solar winds and what's happening out in, in uh, far space. And, yes. and, and that our solar winds from our sun, although could destroy our planet one day, it's actually saving us from the cosmic rays that would yeah. be harmful to us. Um, uh, the heliosphere created by the sun is, mm -hmm. is uh, the solar wind blasting out at a million miles per hour. Yes. Uh, and, and then eventually becoming so, as it spreads out, it gets weaker and weaker, and then it goes subsonic. Uh, and at that point, the, 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 the solar wind goes around behind the sun uh, following the magnetic flux lines. The actual heliosphere of the sun is defined by the magnetosphere, which is our... our the magnetic field that's created by the sun. Yes. Now, now we're outside of that and we're, we're measuring the magnetosphere of the galaxy. 
and the radiation coming from the galaxy is is greater and uh you know over time we're receiving a little bit of radiation damage and hopefully that won't affect us by the end of the mission but it, it definitely is a more dangerous environment out there well, I mean, considering the fact these things were launched back in the 70s and the fact that they're still going, they're, um, still, going. they're, still, they're still operating yeah. and, and the cosmic yeah. rays has not damaged it yet is, is we're going on 44 years, 44. I mean, that right there shows the ingenuity that you engineers when making Voyager uh, did a fantastic yes. job. I, and, I started in 83 and hmm. uh, uh, I was playing rock and roll on the Sunset Strip and, uh, you know, working on the Voyager project at JPL it was a fantastic time period. People from all over the world working on the project, uh, you know, from all, you know, uh, numerous countries, mm -hmm. interesting people, you know, uh, intellectuals and, and uh, you know, uh, lots of fun discussions and, and interesting things going on. And it like I said, it was a wonderful that. time period. And, and um, uh, but my point being that I was there after it was designed. The okay. guys who designed it are real heroes. They uh, created uh, two spacecraft that have lasted this long in, in space and have continued to work. They designed them in such a way that they were able to survive all the perils that are out there. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, um, among them being the radiation that's now causing damage. Exactly. And, and, and for, for the viewers, I mean, uh, everyone says, you know, space is a vacuum, but that's not necessarily true. It's not a vacuum as what you would use to clean your, your carpets. It, it, they call it a vacuum because, you know, there is no air out there. It's a lower pressure, uh, zero pressure. And, and then on top of that, though, there are microscopic uh, particles that are flying through yes. space that we can Cosmic cannot rays see. and, and uh, rays, yes. uh, uh, you know, other subatomic particles that are out there. And, and those damage uh, our aircrafts, uh, our, our spacecrafts that we send uh, into space. And we've even lost some uh, uh, due to it, uh, especially when the, the sun gives off a little hiccup and, uh, and, and sends out those solar winds that can actually damage some of the uh, uh, spacecraft. Yeah, one of the concerns about all that, of course, is in the, for the Mars mission, you know, I mean, because uh, yes. we're going to be spend, sending astronauts out there and there's a lot of radiation that they won't be protected from because the Earth has its own magnetic field that protects us from the sun's, yes. you know, uh, harsh rays. And uh, that radiation will be hitting the spacecraft all the way to Mars and they have to work out a way to protect the astronauts so they, they can live through the mission. Well, I think one of the not. most one of the most viable ways to be able to do that is to use water because uh, you insulate yeah. the entire spacecraft with water uh, with a basically like a double hull, and you fill one of the hulls with water, and you use that for drinking, but also for protecting the astronauts from uh, the harsh rays. Which I know NASA has has thought about that. Isn't that interesting? I mean, you've been doing your research. I mean, yes, I, I, that's it's interesting that uh, we can use water to protect us from the. It from, is. Yeah, well, it's the density of the, the molecules, cap, you know, blocks a lot of the, the radiation from getting into the spacecraft if they yeah. use that method. And, and then on top of that, uh, it's not harmful to drink that water, too, because it, it doesn't cause any damage to the water, the, the rays. But if they hit our uh, system, it can damage our DNA. It can cause cancer and, and defects. Um, but but the water is, is, is quite useful for that. And then, of course, uh, I know that there's talks where if we do eventually get to Mars, we'll have to go down into one of the old lava tubes and, and go underground where we'll be protected from the solar arrays on Mars. Um, but I, I've, heard, yes. I've heard a lot of different ideas and, and even having shelters with, with water surrounding them as well so they can be up, up top. But um, I think the safest bet would be underground. What do you think? And hopefully there's some evidence of microscopic life down there as well oh, yes you know, yes um you know that, that that's an interesting thing i mean our solar system i think that's the legacy of the voyager project is that the, the voyager project has helped define the solar system for us it has you know uh, our solar system is is uh, is it one way of looking at it is very typical the, the way that the planets are formed and the type of planets that are formed relative to their distance from the sun Yes. You know, ranging from rocky planets to ice giants, you know, but uh, we're finding out from our research on exoplanets that uh, this 
typical solar system is not so typical. Uh, most of the solar systems that we're observing out there are, are radically different from ours. Yeah, actually, there are what's called as hot Jupiters, which is our Jupiter, but instead of being in the outer rim where, where it is, um, uh, it, it's actually up close to where Mercury is in our solar yeah. system. And of now, course, you know, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's great to see that you've been reading up on all this stuff and, and learning about it. That's fantastic. Oh, I mean, you know, th this stuff I've known for quite some time, actually, uh, and I'm, I'm constantly keeping myself up to date because this is this is groundbreaking, you know, stuff. I mean, it's it's it, it's it helps expand our knowledge of the universe uh, when yes. it comes to space exploration. And when it comes to that, I'm all for you know, all the different science that comes from it. And, and so I like to follow up on it, just like with the, the Mars um, uh, 2020 uh, project, Ingenuity has been dropped down on the Mars uh, surface. And uh, we have a pre-launch briefing flight for tomorrow. And then on the 9th, it's supposed to take its first flight, which will be the yes. very That'll first be interesting. robotic helicopter to fly on another planet that we built and put there. Yeah. Well, I can't wait till we get out to the uh, ocean planets and uh, check and see if there's life underneath. The, Europa? Those, uh, I, I see. Uh, yeah. Well, Europa, Enceladus. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, even Pluto might have a, a subsurface ocean. Uh, and there's a, a, a Titan, I believe. Yeah, I was just going to say also. that. Yes. T yeah. Titan has liquid methane and ethane on its surface. So instead of. Uh, Are you talking about Triton or, or Titan? Titan. Okay, all right, go ahead. Titan. So, uh, so on Titan, though, it has liquid methane and ethane. And I mean, if, if there's life there, they would be consuming that and surviving on that than water like we would here and oxygen. So, yeah, um, I think the main question is you know, if we do find something out there, is it, does it have DNA or not? Or is it made up in some other way? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, because yeah. so far, our only spectrum that we have, our only uh, way of telling about life is through DNA, but that's here on Earth. We don't know how it is further out uh, out of our solar system or even on other planets within our solar system. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, DNA tends to be a natural development, you know, with uh, the amino acids present and everything else and the, the whole soup that creates the, all the elements for life, um, you know, but that doesn't mean that that's going to be the building blocks of life elsewhere. Well, now, yeah. do you think, do you think carbon life would be the most abundant life that we would find? Or do you think we would find well, it's, like more, it's life? easier to, apparently it's easier for carbon life to develop than silicon life. It is life. because the carbon molecule can be broken uh, down in multiple different ways and then re reconstructed. So it has more flexibility than with silicone, which is more rigid and it can't break down and form with other molecules as easy as what, a carbon molecule can um but i mean it's like that uh one of those episodes on uh, the original star trek where they had that silicone uh creature you know and oh, it yeah. would travel right through other rocks like we travel through air um so you know could there be life like that or would it be strictly carbon based that is yeah you know, yeah well you know another thing about our solar system is that uh we're in, in a relatively quiescent uh, area in in the, in the galaxy and we're in a quiescent galaxy where our, our galaxy has a small super large black hole in the center relative to other galaxies yes and so, the radiation so actually, that comes off of that it would be is a lot less than most other galaxies out there so life is it, 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 it can develop here in the milky way much more easily than most of the other galaxies out there because of the the amount of radiation coming off the black holes in the center well, yeah. yes, yes. So, so ours is actually dormant right now. It's it's not actively uh, feeding, um, and so so and we actually live in basically what's considered the suburbs of, of our galaxy. So, we're far enough away, but we're not too we're not too close. We're not too far. We're we're basically like in the Goldilocks zone within the galaxy. Uh, and then the fact that our galaxy is not actively feeding um uh is is a big help because when it's feeding and you see those you, you know have you seen those uh those rays being shot out when it's feeding because it burps up 
Well, those cosmic yeah. rays that come out of there, that can destroy life. It can even destroy... It, it, exactly. Uh, um, we we can be wiped out in a second by a, a supernova that happens nearby us. Oh, yes. You know, we're, we're very fortunate that life has survived all the uh, tectonic plate movement, which has killed life, killed life off, most of life off on the planet several times in our history. And then, the, of course, when the uh, meteor hit that killed the dinosaurs. Yes. But if those things hadn't happened, we wouldn't be here. But the, the point is that it's very difficult for life to even survive in most environments because there's so much that can go wrong. A solar flare can destroy, uh, you actually, know. Actually, you know what? I have, to, I have to actually contradict on that because life as we know it, complex life, yes, can't. But we do have extreme oh, Microscopic, yeah. Yeah, microscopic life that can survive in very harsh, even we've even stuck that life, even tardigrades, we've stuck on the outside of the ISS and mm -hmm. they've been pounded and pounded, even E. coli by, by uh, 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 rays. And we bring it back and, you know, a lot of them are still alive. The tardigrades, all you have to do is just add water and they pop right back up. I mean, this, well, technically our plan is- I, I stand corrected on that respect. But I, I'm thinking in more in terms of intelligent life. Yes. And another factor that goes into all this is the, fa the fact that our solar system developed from a nebula that was the result of a star that was on the order of 100 times the mass of the sun. <coughs> and those stars are very rare. Yes. But those, those were the stars uh, create, those were the create first all the second... elements that we need to have intelligent life. What? Yeah, so that was that was the uh, first or the second generation stars, because our star is, I believe, a third generation star, correct? Yes, but the previous generation that came before us, the evidence is in the asteroids that have been looked at is mm -hmm. that the elements that were created imply that there was a star 100 times the mass of the sun that, oh. that uh, had a supernova prior to our development, which means that the elements were created within that star that would allow intelligent life to form. Oh, yes. Well, yes, that's yes. another factor that goes into all this, yes. uh, is that is it, are, are all those elements necessary for intelligent life to develop? So is intelligent life more rare than we hope it is because of all this? How, there's not very many stars that are that size that are out there. They're you very know, rare, a, very, say, a fraction of a percent. You know. I have to say, if we are the only life out there, then that's pretty lonely. In this big well, I don't think we are, but I think amount. that that life is going to, is very rare, and uh, we're we're also in an environment where within a billion years or so, the sun is going to have heated up enough that it's going to be very difficult to live on the Earth. So we got to get off of it. That's true. And even though the sun won't die in for five billion years, we've got maybe another billion years here before we got to get off of this star, uh, and and. Um, God, there was something else I was thinking of. Um, oh, I'll, I'll remember it. As we the Andromeda galaxy colliding with uh, our galaxy? Oh yeah, Andromeda, that's, just, that's it. Now, I if the two black holes of the Andromeda and between the Andromeda galaxy, it's, it's amazing that you were thinking in the you know, same line as <laughs> I was. Uh, the, we're on the, the same brain. Those two black holes here. merge, it, the radiation that's going to be released from, from them merging may kill all the life in both galaxies. That's possible, but now, now there is also talks where because of where we are within our galaxy, that when the merge takes place, if Earth was still around, which it wouldn't be because uh, our sun will have already have gone, but if we were, well, we'd a actually couple see billion the years, I'd say, a couple billion years, we would see the two collide and and merge as one over time. Um, now the black holes. Uh, some people think that the black holes won't necessarily merge; they'll just, you know, uh, uh, rotate around each other. But you know, then again, they may very well merge, and then that would be a catastrophic. Event. Well, now, actually, as far as we know, they do merge because there is a study. Unfortunately, I don't have it off the tip of my head, but they're actually able to um, uh, feel, censor the gravitational waves when two black holes merge together and collide yes, into one. But that's a different situation. There's some, there's, this is a, p a paper that I heard about the other day. I okay. don't know if I necessarily agree with it, but then again, I'm not, you know, you know, on, on that level. Um, you know, I haven't studied the same things those physicists have studied, yeah. but that there's a chance that they, that these two black holes may, could not, may not merge, but I would find that very difficult to believe. But what you're talking about is that um, 
uh, what's the name of it? Kip Thorne mm, okay. uh, study, which is where, where they were trying to uh, get an example of gravitational waves. Yes, that's it. By triangulating two, uh, two um, uh, facilities that were designed to, to measure gravitational waves and then uh, triangulate the actual yeah. position that they came yeah. from. And then, and then also, I guess, at each facility, they have pipings, one going down one side, one going down another way. And yeah. then there's a laser that goes down in it. And the computer system, I guess, can, can sense the small, little, tiny uh, movement from the gravitational wave that we get from. Yeah, because of it, the, uh, um, the, way, the light waves will get out, out of sync. Yes. And how much they get out of sync uh, gives us uh, an indication of how intense the gravi gravitational waves were. Yes, yes. And fortunately, they were able to measure them. And then they, uh, Kip Thorne won the, you know, a Nobel Prize. And I got to see him speak a couple of years ago. Very nice. So that was very cool. And I also have a book signed by him. So, Ooh, which is very nice. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been collecting stuff over the years. A couple of books signed by Carl Sagan, you know, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Unfortunately, yeah. I never got to meet uh, Carl Sagan, um, but he, he was actually one of the big uh, people that helped uh, start the Voyager project to get it. Yeah, to get one it of going. his students uh, came to him and, and told him about, well, we have a planetary alignment happen that only happens every 176 years or so. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't it be great if we could send a spacecraft out there and then Carl Sagan, you know, got it going. Yes. He went to Congress and started you know talking about it and everything and got the whole thing and they hired uh dr ed stone who's a uh a, an expert uh professor at uh, caltech on cosmic rays and mm -hmm. so he became the the planet the scientist that ran the project but carl sagan would always be speaking for the voyager and representing the voyager along with ed stone over the years and i got to see one of those talks you know so I have to say, though, when I think of the Voyager project, I think more of it being uh, Carl Sagan's baby, because like he, he, he even he even came up with the uh, the gold record. Um, uh, oh, the, yeah. The, yeah, uh, the gold the record. Yeah. yeah. Did you know um, when the child on there is saying hello from the children of Earth? Did you know that's Carl Sagan's son? I had heard something about it, you know, and, and uh, his wife is still involved with the project. She comes to a lot of the events and and well, and she's even and she on wrote that. the new cosmos. Yeah, um, and, and she and she's actually um, her her brain waves are actually on that plaque on that uh, um, uh, uh, record, and uh, it, it's whenever she would stare at her husband Carl before they got married, and it would be her in love. So it's the sound of a oh, woman's yeah. brain waves in love, and so they added oh, that onto the plate as well. Yeah. Um, huh. Yeah. And so, so a, a lot of the stuff that they did, and I remember there was this comic um, that that came. Well, cool. I mean, but you know, uh, uh, it, it, that was in a pretty intelligent uh, sort of design on the record cover there, showing, giving directions on how to play the record, exactly. and and showing where we were in the universe. And uh, of course, the joke is that uh, why did we give? Them, why did we tell them where we are? Because now they're going to come and get us. Our resources but you know if they have the technology to come here then they don't need our resources That's actually they would be it. able to get more resources in the comets and yeah. the asteroids than what they would on earth oh uh, sure and 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 the the power sources that they were using would are far more advanced than anything we have and then they wouldn't exactly. be using the materials that we exactly. use exactly and, and yeah. you know what and, and, and that would actually bring me up to this here like we uh, with seti we are looking for life with the radio waves but if they're so intelligent, why not use what Einstein called, um, uh, uh, was it, um, spooky action at a distance, which oh, is like quantum mechanics. Exactly, with, with tangling two particles, because when they're uh, quantum entangled, it's instantaneous communication. Yeah, you don't have to uh, wait for, for uh uh, like the problem with, with that, of course, is it, it uh, violates special relativity, but they have confirmed that that happens. But, yes. uh, you know, uh, many people have been trying to explain why that is. And, and uh, you know, like there's the many worlds theory that mm -hmm. uh, anything, anytime anything happens on a quantum level, the universe splits into different two different universes or whatever, based on the probability of the event. And that would mean that there's 
you know, infinity universes out there. And I think it's, that's sort of a ridiculous well, premise. That, or, but, but I mean, they also use that too with saying, if you ever went back in time, if you were ever able to actually do that, you would create another step, timeline. You yeah. Would, yeah. And you would actually create a whole nother universe. Well, uh, I think timeline, that may be, po- that may be possible if we could ever, ever do that. But I, I, my thoughts about it is, is uh, more along the lines of the holographic universe theory, which says that on a quantum level, there's no space. So all, all, quant- all particles in the universe are together. And, and so, you know, events could ha- happen simultaneously, but the implication is that we are a projection of that quantum information. Okay, yes, I understand what you're saying now. Or, or you could go with the, we're all in a video game, which, which I have heard same about deal. that one too. Yeah. yeah, it's basically the same deal. It's just, we're all one big computer program um, matrix basically. And, and we wouldn't know it because as soon as a glitch takes place, that memory would be erased from our memories and the glitch would be fixed by the system. Um, but I mean, because everyone sees reality differently. Everyone has their own perspective of reality because we all see the world differently. And so, I mean, we see the world from our perspective. Exactly. But, and we interpret it through our personal bias. But exactly. I, for, for me, I, I believe that it's all the same event. It's just we all see it differently just exactly. because we're personally biased. So in yeah. essence, it's, just, it's our own personal reality. If you think about it, because it, it, that reality that we are seeing is by, uh, formed by our bias and, and how we perceive things compared to someone else who might see the same exact thing as you, but they see it differently. And so they perceive it differently, which means their reality is slightly different from yours. Yeah, um, which, which is all interesting and, and kind of leads me to the thoughts about our, our software. Yes. You know, we're, we're animals. We, we, we're uh sort of driven by our animal instincts and yet we don't want to admit it to ourselves we don't talk about it we don't bring it up you know we 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 think we're in control of our free will and most of the time the only time when you can exercise free will is when you go against your own nature otherwise you're just going to do what you want to do and what you you your body tells you to do your body tells you what to like what foods you like you don't decide to like a food the food decides for you in your system you know you don't decide what people you're attracted to that's just your nature and your personal bias which is a a lot of that's driven by our our animal instincts yeah and so it's difficult i think for us to get an objective view about ourselves because we're tainted by our software and our software tells us how to act and 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 unless we you know sort of acknowledge that and come to grips with it a, a lot of our behaviors won't improve like our warlike behavior, the way the, the sexes treat each other, the way we uh, view the people in, in water hole number two. You know, when our water hole runs out, do we go and kill them or do we make peace with them? You know, uh, uh, you know uh, we have to rise above that animal view of the world and, and see things on a more objective view and, and behave. Yes. No, I, I agree with you on that. I mean, for us to be able to get out of our own solar system, um, even to get to Mars, it's going to be difficult without cooperation of, of a lot of people, a lot of different countries on Earth. But if we want to be able to expand and really travel outside of our solar system, it's going to take the entire world to come together to actually do that, which means we're going to have to stop the the, the fighting that's taking place uh, in order for yeah, that and to And hopefully the, in the, in the aliens that we meet will not be uh, aggressive in that way towards us. Well, you know, I, you know, I know, I know, um, uh, what was his name? Um, ooh, he, uh, he, he was in the wheelchair, computer voice. I know uh, that's rude to say, but. Uh, oh, uh, um, God, yeah, now I'm having a, a blank. Uh, um, anyway, well, we all know, we, we all know Stephen, Stephen Hawking. Hawking. Stephen, Stephen Hawking. Hawking, that's it, Stephen yeah. Hawking. Uh, so I know, I know he stated that there's a good chance that if aliens came here, they would be hostile. But if you think about it, though, in order for them to be able to get here, they would have to be able to work together. 
they would have had to overcome the same things. Yes, exactly. And, yeah. and so, so I don't see, I, I don't really think that they would be hostile, but would they want to interact with us? No, because we're, I mean, we're capable of destroying ourselves with, with the weapons that we have. They're not, they're not going to want to come over here and they can pick up all of our radio uh, waves and they can see what we think of what would happen when aliens come here. Well, what, yeah, but they may look at our history. They may have been watching us and a, as we exterminate each other, as exactly. we enslave each other, as we war with each other, you know, and, and hopefully they'll see that as their own past. And yeah, these are just animals trying to overcome and, and make a better world, but they've gone through a lot of hardships in order to do it. And I think that any aliens out there who have a society would have gone through the same sort of issues in their development as well. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that's what your point was. And, and I think that's a great point. And again, I just, it's so good to talk to somebody who loves this stuff and is interested in it, reads up on it and, and educate yourself on it. And anybody out there can do that. Of course, you have to be oh, yeah. interested in doing it. Yeah. But it's all out there for us. And we can well, understand almost anything. Relativity, it's its not all that difficult to you, understand. You do, you, you do have to be careful, though, on, on where you're getting your information. Because unfortunately, there is some YouTubers or, or yeah, other crazy sites people out there, yeah. that, that, that don't actually give out the complete information. So when I'm you know, doing my research, I'm fact-checking. I'm making sure... And I don't, I don't, I don't cherry pick, you know, so, yeah. so, and, and that's key. Like you have, for me with my channel here, I, I try and get all the information and, and release it out. I, I like it to be yeah. as good as possible. Well, um, you know, uh, scientists are people too. And you have to kind of uh, also think the same in terms of those. I mean, the people that we all trust and admire, you know, they're just people. Exactly. And sometimes they'll come up with something a little uh, out in the left field as well. And, you know, it's just, you know, like you said, everybody has their own perspective, but I think with an individual, well, let's say an individual like yourself who fact checks, who checks around, listens to everybody can get a good idea of what's real and what's not real and what's wrong and what's, exactly. you know, exactly. what's healthy, so to speak. Exactly. Yes. And yes, apparently, yeah. Jonathan, that's what you've been doing. So I, I commend you. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you. No, uh, and I've also been keeping up with uh, SpaceX. They actually launched uh, their uh, Starlink, I believe it was 23, and um, they launched another 60 more satellites out there this morning. Um, and they have a road closure set up for tomorrow in Boca Chico, Texas, and it looks like uh, SN15 may be rolling out to the uh, suborbital pad. So um, I get these updates. Every, literally every day I get a new update. Cool. Uh, from Mary, um, who who videotapes everything out there because she lives in that little town. She's the last Boca Chico Texan uh, that actually lives there. Everyone else that lives there is all SpaceX employees. So oh, she's the last wow. one there. And, and she's literally filming every single piece of equipment that comes in and out. And she gives it to uh, NASA Space Flight, which then in turn, you know, I get their update from their channel on YouTube. But, um, and you can literally see them, the construction happening every day and it getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Oh, uh, you know, and, and watch out NASA, watch out everybody else, you know, because the private companies are maybe the ones out there first claiming, yeah, I, you know, well, mining they, asteroids, you know, I mean, they, changing they're, they're the hoping, universe. That they're hoping to have uh, BN, uh, BN2 um, onto the uh, launch pad, uh, which is the booster number two, and they're hoping for by the end of April, and they're hoping by the end of this year, they will have one starship that goes orbital. God, you know, we're truly entering the space age, and gee, it'd be great to be alive <laughs> Again, 100 years from now. Imagine being alive 100 years from now, which actually may, you know, I think they may solve some of those problems in the next 100 years. You know, we may be starting to live much longer Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think it's a little bit too late for me, you know, but uh, uh, I would love to be alive 100 years from now to see what's going on. Oh, Imagine the adventures you could have. 
honeymooning on on a, a moon uh, uh, outside of Jupiter, looking at Jupiter as you wake up in the morning outside the window and you're protected from the radiation and and then traveling to the stars and seeing what's yes. out there. You know, so, can you imagine how great I, I that mean, would be? Actually, it, it would be actually fantastic to be able to actually travel to a whole nother solar system, let yeah. alone just in our own, but actually to be able to travel that length of distance uh, I think eventually we could get there if we work together. Um, yeah. But but unfortunately, sure. you know, we do have those issues. But yeah, I mean, I t I actually put in an application to be one of the first Mars settlers. Oh um, gosh! On Mars, uh, unfortunately, you. I was not accepted. But um, and and because of my injuries, there's no way I would be able to to withstand the uh, the launch. But wouldn't it be uh, worth the risk, you know? And and yeah, uh, no, maybe no. you won't. Uh, maybe you won't ever get back to Earth. Or you won't live that long there. But at least you would be among the first settlers. Exactly. Yeah. Being one of the first people to be able to say, "I was one of the first humans to walk on a whole other planet," because no astronaut can say that. There are astronauts that can say, "Yes, I've walked on a moon, but not yeah. another planet." Now that's yeah. a whole other thing, right there. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it, it's, you know, it's incredible the future that we could have if yes. we don't destroy ourselves. Yes. I think we won't. I think we'll survive. I think, you, you know, us and the cockroaches will be the last things alive on the planet, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think it's all going to happen. And I just, I feel a little sad that I'm going to miss it. Well, well the I next mean, thousand years should be great. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, now, now, uh, SpaceX, they are saying that they do want to try and get to Mars by uh, within the 2030 range. With yeah, Starship. Well, that's, that's and, great. And I have to say so far with the work that they've done, and the work that they continue to do, they have a really good shot of actually pulling that off. And, and so that's, that's why I'm constantly watching it. And, and I'm constantly, you know, posting up uh, updates on here. Uh, because it's 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 uh, it, it's a history making event right now that's going on, and yeah. and when they when they built the Apollo um, and the Saturn V, you know that was done in secret. You know the public never got to actually see them build these rockets, and 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 um, and even uh, have such close access to the launch pads like they do in Boca Chico, Texas right now. So please, all you viewers out there, if you decide to go out there, pay attention to the rules there. Do not try and enter into the gate because all it takes is one person to go in there and ruin it. And then we lose the entire open ability that they have for us right now, where we're actually able to see the rockets being built. We're actually able to get up close and see the launches as well and get cameras close enough for it. So but definitely go out there, check it out. It's it's an amazing facility. Um, have you been there? I have not been there, but I, I've, I've taken a few uh, uh, virtual tours after this whole uh, pandemic and, and I get vaccinated. I'm hoping to be able to go down there and see an actual Starship launch um, and, and check it out myself and, and record it. So I, I am I'm hoping be to great. be able to Yeah. Yeah. I've never also, seen a launch or I've never seen a launch or a shuttle landing. Uh, you know, I had opportunities, but I just didn't take them. I was always busy in the 80s, you know, because I, during the day I'd be working on Voyager or, you know, on a sh if there was a midnight shift, I'd be there. But then I'd be rehearsing with my band, you know, mm -hmm. other than that. So I was like always busy 24 hours a day, getting just a few hours sleep every night. But yeah. it was great. You know, it was a great time. Well, that's good. Yeah, no, the 80s were a, were a good time. I was an 80s child myself, so. I, uh, I grew up in the 80s, but uh, I mean, uh, I, I, I have more memories within the 90s, but it, uh, it, it was a great time, innovative time. Uh, a lot of new stuff came out, uh, video games, computers. Um, we, we had, we had yeah. a, actually, that started out really in the 70s, the, towards the late 70s, really. But uh, early 80s is when we really started getting the, uh, the video game consults and um, you know, when my band would play at the Roxy or the Troubadour, you know, it was, uh, mm -hmm. the, a vast majority of the audience were JPL people every time. Oh, really? we, we were headlining because of that, because we had a huge audience, you know, thanks to the JPL people. It was just, and there was so much 
excitement and mm -hmm. everything. It, it was just a real fantastic time to be working in the space industry and, and uh, playing rock and roll. <laughs> And, you, you know now rock and roll is kind of gone mm -hmm. you know the space industry is being taken over by people who are billionaires who who dreamt about going into space when they were kids watching the nasa videos you know actually it, it, it's 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 uh it's funny because uh elon musk actually said that what got him going for spacex was why haven't we gone back to the moon yet and why yeah. haven't we gotten to mars yet and so and so they that cut was the budget. That's that's what got him going. And he only had the funding to make three rockets, uh, three of the uh, Falcon rockets. And and uh, and it was only his last attempt, his third attempt, where he was able to actually land it and start receiving funding from NASA and, and other organizations that were that were willing to fund be, uh, because he was actually able to, to do it. But he nearly lost everything trying to do SpaceX, but it was taking that risk and having that vision that now wow. we have reusable um, uh, rockets. And on top of that, the one that was used today, the booster that was used today for Starlink was the same one used for Doug and, um, was it Doug and Greg? Doug, Doug, Doug and Greg, yeah, Doug and Bob, Bob and Doug. Uh, who went up into the crew demo uh, uh, on the uh, Dragon uh, for the first time uh, back to the ISS. And uh, it was that same booster that took them up, just took up this payload. Good for him, man. So, yeah. so they are reusing these things, um, and, and which is making it cheaper now. Uh, the cost is going down. Um, and He's living starts, the dream. Yeah, He's he, is. The dream. he is. Have yeah. you seen, though... Um, one of the starships coming down and uh, and trying to land. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I did see the. I mean, after you pointed out to me a couple of videos to watch, and I watched them. You know, because I haven't been keeping up on it. And I should be, you know. Uh, but uh, I, I'm, I'm there when I hear the news. I'm right there with you. You know. <laughs> yeah. No. I, I mean, uh, I, I literally have my my updates to for when it's space related uh news especially with um, uh spacex and, and starship it, it pops right up onto my phone and I, i'm able to you know immediately go on and, and check out what's going on and and get it but um the the stuff there is just it, it's amazing they even have their own locks um uh distillery site that they're working on uh which is still uh being worked on so they're going to be producing their own um locks uh, which uh, is a combustible, which is used to help uh, with the rockets. Uh, it's oh, the oxygen uh, combustible. Yeah, so they're, they're basically making the oxygen there for the combustion of the engines, uh, for the Raptor engines. Oh. Uh, and then they also have the liquid nitrogen uh, tanks too, but they're going to be producing their own locks. Oh. You know, the guy's going to, he's doing it, man. He is. He is. It's amazing, you know, I mean, uh, uh, He's creating a dynasty too, and then, you know, uh, he's going to be the one that's going to be remembered, you know, for hundreds of years. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, his company. I mean, I mean, what five hundred years from now, you know, SpaceX is probably still going to be there. You know. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I I, I see them uh, really pioneering the the entire industry right now. Now we do have Blue Origin. 
uh, which their their concept, uh, and I've seen some of their test flights and launches. I don't know if you've if you've seen it, but um, it is quite interesting. It, it, it's completely different uh, uh, tactic of what what um, uh, what the are they doing uh, reusable? Doing. Yes, it, it is reusable, uh, but it, it's only it's only going to be a suborbital. So it's basically you know sending people oh, they, up. Is that the one that they dropped from the seven forty seven or whatever? No, no, no. So so, so it's actually going to get launched. And then the the um, the emergency uh, boosters in case if something should go wrong, you're actually it's in the center of the spacecraft, and you sit around it. Okay, so if there's a problem, it, this thing detaches and pulls you off, and there's a rocket right underneath there that shoots you out, you know, to safety. Huh. But but it is a reusable one where it takes you up and then you come back down. And it uses chutes, and then it it uh, uh, and then also it has the um, engines underneath that will give it a little cushion as as it hits onto the ground. But but it it's reusable the capsule for human flight. It doesn't on, sound like it gets out. And it it goes. Uh, doesn't sound like it gets out in the weightless space. It, it will. So so they do have two options where they'll do suborbitals for for people to be able to fly, and then they also can take them up into the ISS as well. Uh, and oh. get into orbit. Uh, right now, they're they're testing on the suborbital from uh, from the last updates that I've gotten. Uh, but now the the crew uh, dragons now the dragon capsules, those ones can only be used once for human travel, uh, because when it splashes down, it splashes down into the sea, and once that happens, they won't allow humans to fly on it again. But it can be reused for cargo. Compared to oh. Origin, where it. <laughs> It's not fully reusable. The the emergency motors for, for, for the end, like those have to be replaced every time. So it's not as reusable, but it lands on the ground. And so the entire capsule can be reused compared to with uh, the crew dragon. It, it can't be reused because it lands in the sea. And originally they were going to have it land on the land with their uh, emergency uh, rockets that, come, uh, yeah. that are on the side of it. But uh, it was going to take too long, and it was just quicker if they just landed in the sea, and and it would oh. be less he uh, headaches because that's something that has been proven before, and it's much easier to prove. A you know, it's interesting that um, Elon Musk is has basically not compromised, and he's uh, he's done everything, and he's he's created everything the way he wanted to create it, and. Uh, his group of engineers have made it happen. And uh, that alone is a kind of accomplishment that, uh, you know, hasn't been done since Apollo. There's been yeah. so many compromises since Apollo yeah. and in NASA, you know, and NASA isn't as run efficiently as it used to be. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of politics and everything and, and uh, they have to fight every year for a budget. Yeah, so, see, that's that, that's the problem, and 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 so many people say, oh well, NASA has such a big budget. If we took NASA's budget and put it, no, no. If you look at it, NASA gets like a small. sip of drinking water compared to a whole yeah. cup of water that other uh, you know government um, uh, facilities get. So they they get very very little out of the whole budget. They get like a sippy of water from the whole budget of the cup of and, water. And who's doing stuff purely for the benefit of mankind? NASA. NASA, exactly. I mean, a Purely lot of, for the benefit of mankind. Everything that we really have now, a lot of it has come because of the science and the research done by NASA in their experiments yeah. in space um, yeah. and exploration. And if it wasn't for them, there'd be a lot of the technology that we take for granted now. It would, yeah, it would have been developed but a lot later. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. I mean, really, the, the computers uh, came around due to uh, WW2 it was, you know, to help crack the, the codes. And of course, the first computer that was used, uh, which was an IBM computer to send uh, astronauts to the moon, basically, the computing ability was basically a You're talking about Apollo 8? Uh, no, uh, Apollo, uh, uh, Apollo 11. But Apollo Eight was the first one to use a computer to to that actually uh, uh, was in charge of the navigation of the ship as they did. Oh yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I, I was talking about with, with actual humans in it and landing onto another surface 
when they landed on the moon, the, uh, the uh, computer ability was basically as smart as a calculator. Yeah, well, we the Voyager, the, uh, the, the processing power. Voyager power. one and two use three 4K computers, and they're redundant. So there's eight, eight K and plus a little bit more mm -hmm. on each computer. But you know what I'm saying? Four K. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and and so we you know we were able to command the spacecraft to do different things and whatever we wanted it to do, which is 4K. Yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty amazing. You know. <laughs> And yeah, nowadays I mean, you can't write software that's you know you can't write a program to go to the to buy groceries for less than 4k you know <laughs> <clears throat> that is true i mean that that's one good thing though about nasa like they they have the ability to to make up the equipment and and to get it done unfortunately though a lot of the stuff that they'll use at time is sometimes out of date or it's it's up to date at least at the time being when it's launched but then you have to remember sometimes these missions can go on for 10, 20, 30, even 44 years for the Voyager project. And now yeah. the equipment on there is completely out of date. But well, there's nothing uh, they can really do about it. I, I, I was very fortunate to have worked with the, the, a lot of the original designers of the spacecraft. William Breckenridge, who designed the, the models for mm -hmm. uh, all the software and the, the model of the spacecraft behavior. Um, you know, Chris P. Jones was the first uh, uh, spacecraft team chief amazing uh, engineer one of the most amazing people i've ever met uh, ed stone the project scientist you know uh, yeah. and uh, it's these guys are the old guard you know and uh, the heroes you mm -hmm. know that uh, you know put jpl not you know the explorer put jpl on the map kind of but the voyager project is is one of the greatest achievements that nasa has ever had uh, the is. second greatest man uh, unmanned uh, project, you know, next to the Hubble, uh, and that wasn't JPL, but you know, uh, but it, we're a real feather in NASA's cap, mm -hmm. and the people who who were there at the beginning of the Voyager project ended up running the laboratory. They ended up being the people who were in charge, you know. Well, I mean, and, I mean, because they, they know the, they know the, the 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 spacecraft the best. I mean, they are the natural choice to be the one to run. The, the lavatory for it because they they know what they're doing i mean yeah. they um the the amount of work and time and and then they don't even know if it's going to actually work or if it's even going to get off the launch pad because it could blow up you know things do happen with rockets unfortunately or even you know we we've sent stuff to mars and you know because of one small little calculation you know and use instead of using uh kilometers they they, they use feet and so, i know can you imagine that guy's life was ruined right there oh yeah. I mean, yeah he was like you know uh, oh, so his terrible. friends were probably like man how could you do that like really oh, come on can you, can you, you know how do you get past that I, I yeah know. that's why you know everything that i did i, I triple checked yeah Every, triple check everything you know because you don't want to be the guy that loses the spacecraft yeah, exactly. Yeah, you you miss the target because of the calculation is different, and 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 you completely miss Mars and just you know go right past it. I mean, it's yeah, it's and, and yeah. all that all that time, all those years and everything. Even for um, j just for ingenuity, it took them three years, if I'm not mistaken, just to uh, come up with the design and a way to test it. Plus the software, the new software needed. For ingenuity to fly on Mars, and so it took three years just for that alone. Not to mention perseverance, you know, yeah. and, and, and ingenuity. Yeah. A lot of the engineers working twenty it. hours a day. Yeah, exactly. And so, so all that hard work, and then just to have it lost and not be able to use it. I mean, it, it's got to be like losing a child. I would think. You know, I, I was. Uh, I watched the first. I mean, the the. Um, you know, the, what the seven minutes of terror, or whatever it is. Oh, yes. Happened. Yes. The seven minutes. Terror, uh, yes. for our, it was opportunity or whatever. Right? Uh, and uh, I, I didn't think it was going to work. <laughs> you know, oh, I didn't they, think it was going to happen. I didn't think maneuver. they were going to be able to do it. There was too many things going on, mm -hmm. you know, too many, you know, a parachute and then rockets had to go off at the right time. And then they had to drop part of the craft, you know, uh, you know, on, on cables, on the crane, on cables yeah. no less. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked. It, it did. Worked. It did. I mean, that was that was actually their first um, test run, basically. And it was like, okay, 
let's see if we can get it to work. If, if we don't, we just lost, you know, the, this, this yeah, billion yeah. dollar, you know, craft, but hey, let's see if we can do it. And they actually pulled it off and then they pulled it off again with perseverance. I know. Yeah, that, 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 that's, that's an amazing achievement, you know, but to now be able to I, do that consistently. Now, I do know with Perseverance, though, it did have some new updates, though, uh, when it came to that landing, um, where the computer actually was able to pinpoint a safe location and direct itself to there. Um, and so it had some yeah. new imaging software to help with that, uh, which helped them, you know, get down a lot easier than previous times, I guess. Uh, yeah. So they knew well, you know, you, you improve, what, improve as you go along. Yeah, you know, exactly, hopefully yeah. you don't forget something along the way and like the O-rings and, the, you know, on, yeah. on the Challenger. And, you know, that happened during the, the uh, Uranus encounter. And it, it uh, we had all the press trucks outside of JPL and they were all lined up and, and mm -hmm. the press was all there for the encounter. And then the Challenger blew up. God, it was a double disaster because yeah. of what happened with the astronauts and that program. Plus the Voyager encounter was ignored. You know, also uh, before Challenger took place, uh, I'm forgetting his name, but it was it was the uh, the kid from uh, uh, Christmas Story, um, and uh, Peter Billingsley or whatever. I, I, yeah, I believe so. Yeah, yeah, the, the one with the soap in the mouth. And um, anyway, so yeah. apparently, apparently, when he was a kid and this whole thing took place, someone came to him and said, "You do know if this all turns out well, we're going to want to send a kid up into space. Would you be interested in something like that?" No, he and, said, yeah, I'd rather direct movies. That's what he said. And, and, and he That's said, what yes. He, did. He, he said, yes, though, that, <laughs> he, that he would. Oh. And, and, then, and then, of course, the whole Challenger thing took place. And, and because of what happened, you know, that whole, that whole thing was scrapped. But oh, apparently, though, they were, they were teaching wow. kids, though, how, how you would be able to eat in space and, and how it, they were showing actual videos that I saw in this documentary about Challenger and uh, that NASA did. And, and in there, they were showing these kids how you would be able to eat in space, what kind of food is in there, how the packets are. And, and it was basically a way to try and get kids into wanting to go to space. And that, well, that was the flight with the school teacher. That yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. And so that's, that's why they thought, okay, if this goes well, if we can prove that, yes, we can send the everyday person up into space perfectly fine. You know, this will open up the doors a lot more for us. And yeah, it could have if, Unfortunately, the O-rings did not fail on Challenger, but they did, and and unfortunately, you know, plans were changed. But we 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 could have been, you know, orbiting space just the average Joe person by now if that didn't happen. Yeah, but I know. There's a lot. Well, of you know, the thing happened. is, my my feelings are about that is that, um, you know, every day we hear about you know a, a non-military action taking place but where some, uh, you know, a helicopter crashes killing seven soldiers, mm -hmm. you know, or this or that it happens all the time in the military. And we're taking a, a huge risk every time we launch a spacecraft, no matter how well designed it is. And, and you're going to lose a crew here and there. And That's that true. doesn't mean you should stop the whole project, you know, for and delay the whole project for a couple of years. Yes, you need to resolve the problem like they did with the Apollo situation. Mm -hmm. They resolved the problem within a year, and then they had Apollo 8 up there, you know, yes. um, and uh, 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 but, you know, because of the press and, and everybody paying hyper attention to what's going on, when we do lose a crew with NASA, it becomes a major deal, but we're losing crews all the time, you That's know, in, in flight, That's you know, true. military I Training and, and everything else, you know. And, and if you speak to any of those astronauts at NASA, I guarantee you they would tell you that it's worth the risk. It, it, it's more than worth the risk because yeah. the the advancements that we get from from launches and from the experiments that are done from those launches uh, benefit humanity a lot more than than you know being too afraid to go up there because you're afraid something might happen. They're willing to take. Yeah, that I mean, risk. a lot of the, the original them. astronauts are test pilots. Yeah, like, exactly. like I said, test pilots, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. you know they were taking a risk. And, well, and do you know over what? Over. Why do you know why? Uh, one reason why they they use uh, the test pilots, the military test pilots, because uh, they had the balls to deal with the radical. Not situation, just that, or? but a, a lot of them didn't have families. Oh. So so if one died, there's not a family that they have to worry about. So, so they were, they were a little bit easier at times to be able to get 
you know, pilots that, that, that didn't really have families. And of course we did have some that did have families. Um, but, but yeah, uh, they, they originally looked into those there because one, they don't, they don't have families and two, they're, they're, they're used to flying experimental aircraft that have not been proven before as well. Uh, but they also looked into, uh, it was military pilots to see first, it was the Marine Corps and Navy. And then the, uh, and then, uh, Originally, they were going to go with the Air Force, and they go, no, let's, let's go with, with the Navy and the Marine Corps um, as the test pilots, uh, um, yeah. you know, and, to fly and, the first know, Apollo. And then they also had Air Force as well, too, eventually. But Well, you know, and also these were the kind of people that had been tested and, and were, were able to react to situations uh, uh, on the spot without losing their cool. Exactly. You know, and that, that you know, they, they're... They're true heroes, you know. They are, they are. Although, I mean, Gus Grissom did unfortunately have a slight issue coming out from his capsule. Uh, oh, yeah. Launch. You know, we lost his capsule and, and of course he forgot to close one of the uh, tubes uh, on his suit. And so we actually almost lost him in the ocean. He actually yeah. almost drowned. And, and the people at NASA <laughs> were seeing the footage and they had to get on the radio to the chopper pilot and say, forget the capsule. We're about to lose an astronaut. Get over there and get Gus. Um, because he, he yeah. was starting to drown. And I guess yeah, the, the, the capsule was going down and pulling him yeah. with it. No, no, no. His suit was filling with water. That was the problem. Oh. He, he forgot to close a little uh, door on his, on his suit. There's like this little uh, air nozzle for it. And you have to seal it off. Oh. And he forgot to oh. seal one of them. And so air was coming, uh, water was coming into it after he got out of the capsule. And yeah. so, so what happened is he was trying to give the sign of, I need help, come and get me. But the pilot thought he was telling him, get my ship. And so they were oh. struggling with the ship and then NASA realized, wait, Gus is having serious problems here. They got on the radio and said, hey, forget the capsule, get Gus right now before we lose our astronaut. Yeah. And, um, and so they were able to rescue him, but, but yeah, it just, Unfortunately, though, we're all humans and we all make mistakes. But now he did oh, not blow sure. his hatch like people, you know, like the news media was saying. It was actually faulty. And, and, uh, and that unfortunately led eventually to, you know, Apollo 1's death um, because of the, the new hatch system that they put in because of what happened to Grissom on his first oh, yeah. launch. Oh, it's, oh okay. I, that, so that was connected with the high oxygen level. Yes. Yeah, so, so what happened happen. is, what happened is the, the way that they designed the new hatch, it couldn't be opened as quickly as what it originally was. All you had to do, if oh, you so they couldn't open escape. it right away, yeah, you could you could hit the little emergency escape and it would blow the hatch. Well, because that blew off so easily on Grissom's flight, they changed the entire uh, hatch, and so it wasn't able to open as quickly as what it was before. And so that's why they couldn't get the hatch open to get the men out. But, wow. with, the, but with the fresh oxygen, I mean, you, you had literally just seconds and it took them, I believe about a minute to get into the hatch, a minute or two, oh, uh, yeah. because, because of the way it was designed. And it was designed that way to ensure it didn't accidentally breach while they're in flight. So- Oh, you know, that's interesting that you're, you're saying that's, uh... Yeah, because the way I'd already, I mean, I had always heard or, or read about it was because of the high oxygen level. But what you're saying makes sense. They should have been able to get out. Well, yeah, yeah. But but even with the yeah. high oxygen level, like I said, they, they would have only had just just moments, a few seconds to be yeah. able to get out. Because yeah, but they should oxygen, have been able so to. It, yeah. But, but, but they were unable to open up the hatch. Even the crews on the outside on the pad weren't able to open it in time because of the new hatch system that they had at the time. Yeah. But I mean, unfortunately, things like this happen when, when we're experimenting new ideas and new, um, new uh, uh, ways to get us to space and, and accidents are prone to happen. But everyone involved yeah. is aware of that and everyone's willing to accept that risk. Accidents are going to happen and you're going to lose people uh, you know. and they know the risk. Exactly. They wouldn't be exactly. doing it otherwise. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's why I give them all, all the appreciation and props that they deserve because, sure. and not, and not just yeah. to the astronauts, but, but to the engineers and, and to can the you imagine the Russians, people. the Russian cosmonauts, you know, oh, yeah. they, they didn't have the protection of, 
it, they were flying by the seat of their pants every oh, time yeah. they went up. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Actually, when they did their first, uh, have you seen the video when they did their first um, spacewalk? They almost lost the cosmonaut. Oh dear. Mm -hmm. And you, and you know what happened with the the first the animal they sent up? It, it, it died. Up. It died a horrible death before even getting in space. Yeah, that's what I heard. Yeah. yeah. The, the, that's what I heard. But yeah, the their first spacewalk didn't go so well. The the suit originally they wanted to test it on the previous flight and something happened and it was destroyed. And so they couldn't test the suit. So then they decided, okay, we'll launch the cosmonauts and have them do it anyway and test the suit up there as they go along. Unfortunately, because of the vacuum and the low pressure, his suit expanded so much he couldn't get back into the hatch. And so by the time he got back on Earth, he lost, I think, about, um, I think they said it was like 20 or 30 pounds he lost worth of weight trying to get himself wow. back into the hatch. And it was so narrow, like he had to go in and then turn himself around because he couldn't go in feet first. So he had to go in head first, but then the way to seal the hatch, you had to go in feet first. So then he has to turn around in this narrow little thing, basically having to snap your back in half in order to get turned around, so to speak. And, and then he was finally able to close the hatch and seal it, but it, it took much longer and they, they almost lost him over it. But the, and, and because there was no communication because of that iron wall, and this is why communication when it comes to space is key. Because of that, they didn't tell the Americans on anything about that. And so we were testing our own suit and we found the same problems, but if we were aware of it, we could have come up with a better design ahead of time and we actually almost lost one of our astronauts as well due to the same issue. But but we did figure it out. And now our suits are, are a heck of a lot better. And they, they keep the astronaut cool uh, when it's hot. And they keep them uh, uh, warm when, when, when it's too cold. And, uh, uh, and it's basically a personal spaceship now. Well, you, well, you know, Jonathan, you're, you're a walking encyclopedia about the history of space flight. And I think your podcast is going to it's going to take off. Well, thank you. Thank you. Know, you. Actually, I don't think there's that many people out there doing what you're doing. Uh, there, there's a few, actually. Um, there is a uh, everyday astronaut. Uh, you know, he, he'll he'll talk about uh, what's going on right now in, in, with SpaceX. And he has some documentary videos on. Yeah, on but out of uh, how many podcasts out there? Okay, oh, yeah, there's a yeah. couple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's not a whole lot of people that, that really uh, dive into, into all this, but. I, it's something I love. I mean, how could you not? You know, the, the no. possibilities are endless out in space. Like, we don't even fully understand everything that space is made of because a large chunk of it is dark matter and dark energy, and we have no idea what that is. Yeah. You know, but it makes yeah. up the most of our universe, you know? Yeah. So it's just uh, the... The imaginations, the, the ideas that could come just from space flight is is what is what grabs me. Like the, all the new information that we're always learning. Well, you know, and all the breakthroughs in science too. Exactly. You know, that are happening I right mean, now in general. You know, I mean, uh, the, uh, you know, I think astronauts are important. You, they may not, the, the uh, manned program may not progress science as much as the unmanned. But it is necessary because the, the we the people identify with those heroes out there when, and what they're doing, and it, and it brings us into the equation. Whereas the unmanned flights often go, you know, people in one side of the head yeah. and out the other, and people aren't really paying attention to what the science well, breakthroughs are. But we're having science breakthroughs in every uh, area of science now continually. It's amazing what's happening now. Three hundred and sixty-five uh, days uh, of the year. There is science being done on the ISS. They have they have yeah. machines up there that are constantly running different science uh, uh, tests that they, sure. they that they sent up and and so so we're constantly experimenting and it's those experimentations you know that are what giving us our technology our 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 scientific field it's helping us to expand that. Um, and and our well you know there's an argument in NASA about I mean, the you know, unmanned people are always complaining that they don't get the same attention as a as a man program, you know. <laughs> but it's it's understandable, you know. It's understandable. You know, it, it it is. But I have to say though, I think though they've gotten quite a bit uh, more viewers 
with this whole March 2020 with perseverance and, and ingenuity, um, I have found that there are quite a few more people that are interested in it, but there could be so much more um, that, that need to really get involved. I mean, look at, um, uh, what is it called? Inspiration 4, uh, where you could have a chance to actually go up to the ISS on a SpaceX rocket. All you have to do but is you know, donate. You should get your pod, you start advertising on your podcast, get the viewers, save up the money, and go up there and space yourself. <laughs> there we go. I think you could do it. I think you could do it. Keep going with your podcast. Oh, yeah. I'm, you know? I'm, definitely, I'm definitely planning Are you on reading that. up on how to get advertising and how to make money with it and everything? Are you learning all that stuff, too? I mean, oh, you yes. should, should be. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, you need so many subscribers and, and so many hours of your videos uh, yeah. watched. Do what you have to do. Oh, oh you yeah. Got, you, you're, the love of what you're doing comes out, and in, uh, you, can, you can see it, and, and it, it's catching. You know, your enthusiasm will catch on with the audience, and uh, I, I can see it happen. Well, thank you, thank you. And actually, I, I think it's uh, about time for us for us to end because I do have a few other things that I <laughs> need to take care of. I'm actually going to be doing another video on our uh, on the um, expeditionary forces, book three and book three point five. Well, by the way, I'm reading those books now. Uh, Are you? Know, you? I'm on the second one. Oh, there so you go. I, I, I bought all of them. So I'm going to... I'm going Very to nice. This is, so you're on Spec Ops right now, huh? Yeah. yeah. Wait, wait till you get to uh, Paradise. Paradise is actually quite funny. I, I, there, there was uh, quite a few times where I actually had to rewind because of what something Skippy said, because of what Bishop did or, or the idea Bishop came up with and Skippy couldn't, you know, come up with that idea. Um I think uh, I'm, right, I'm right there now at that spot on, on Spec Ops. On oh, yeah, yeah. It, it, it happens in Spec Ops, too, yes. Now, uh, yeah. Trouble on Paradise is not part of the same series. It's a uh, branch, not branched off, but it's um, it, it gives you more of the backstory of the people that are left on Paradise, but it doesn't follow any of the main characters. So it's just like a oh, side okay. story. Okay, and it's only five hours long. Uh, but it's so good, it could actually be part of the main story. It really could. Yeah. Um, but, but it's basically like after the paradise book, what happens to everyone on paradise due to the results of that first book uh, of book three. Oh yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, so, so you're definitely in for, for, uh, for a good listen there. Uh, and same with all of you viewers out there, definitely highly recommend checking out expeditionary. And one Force. thing you should say, or I could say about it is that the author, uh, has a great view of the world and how people should conduct themselves and about doing the right thing. Exactly. Yes. And, and uh, I think that's important. You know, a, a lot of people are turned off when you say military science fiction because of military, but no, this is, these are good people that are doing a, trying to do the right thing. And the author's view of the, of the world and the universe is uh, open-minded. And, and, and it's also, it's not all military too, because they do have some civilian scientists that are on there um, with Bishop yeah. and, and his crew and, and the uh, uh, merry band of uh, pirates. Um, so off the, uh, yeah. they're, they're, they're Jolly Roger. So um, uh, yeah. yeah. I, well, it, this is the kind of military that you want to be out there in, uh, in space when it's happening. Yeah. And uh, uh, I, I can highly recommend uh, from what I've read, I can highly recommend starting the series. Oh, yeah, it, it, it's definitely well worth it. But uh, yeah, I mean, all you viewers out there, thank you again. Though We appreciate you coming out and listening and, and tuning in. Please like this video and hit subscribe uh, and make sure you hit the bell icon to uh, make sure that you're uh, caught up to date with every post that I do. But Thomas, I'd like to thank you again for joining me. And I would really love to have you on again uh, and we can talk more. Um, but uh, thank you all, and uh, this has been another Reality Overload, and I will see you all out in reality. Thank you. Cool.